Thank you. You know, it's, it's, it's odd because, you know, we've always been at odds, the administrative and, and, the, and the clinical practice. And I, I, th I really thank Sherry for inviting me here, you know, in, into the, the, the den, right, to uh, talk about these issues. But you have to understand from, our C from the CEO suite, and again, I'm not a CEO on purpose, but from our perspective, this has been a very, very challenging transition for us. How many people here work in a not-for-profit hospital? Almost everybody, right? Okay. The not-for-profit hospital, you know what it used to be? Well, who's on the board of a not-for-profit hospital? The same people who are on the board of the opera and the art gallery and the other local charities, okay? It was a charity, okay? It wasn't a business. Now it's a business. It used to be much easier. Let's take a trip down memory lane and look at the old days, right? Hill-Burton bond financing, okay? There was a federal government program called Hill-Burton that funded the building of hospitals. That's where you see so many hospitals, right? Cost-based reimbursement. Who knows what this is? What is it? Do you remember? You get paid for everything you use plus the left Can you imagine running a business and you get paid for what your cost is plus? How easy is that, right? You turn in your cost to the government and they pay you. Easy, right? Volume, volume, volume. Let's get more people in. All we need to do is volume, okay? What's happening now? We have to look at value, right? Healthcare universe revolved around the hospital. Is, who's from California, anybody? What's the difference between California and the East Coast in terms of hospitals and physicians? Huh? No employment. Why not? Yep. So what happened is, you see in California these huge systems, these huge IPAs, these huge physician groups. On the East Coast it's different, okay? A lot of the communities organize around the hospital. The entire medical practice, if you think about it, revolved around the hospital. We talked yesterday about the new competitors out there in the landscape. It's not all about the hospital anymore, okay? It's about the payers, it's about large physician groups. So we used to be the center of the universe. We're still sort of the center of the universe, but not quite. And that's a, that's a hard thing to swallow. Um, but it was a really easy business because, listen to this, we had highly trained, highly skilled professionals, i.e. physicians, came to our hospital, provided services, and we didn't have to pay them. How awesome is that, right? The traditional medical staff model, where you did not have to pay them. Maybe a little bit of medical directorships, but they came into your hospital, provided services, generated a lot of technical charges, okay, and that's what the business model was. So this is what MHA, Master of Hospital Administration, used to be. Make your board happy as one, and remember, the board was just the people from the community. But the second one, all you needed to do was keep this free labor that was coming into your hospital, keep them happy. So the best thing you need to know is what type of donuts to put in the physician's lounge. And of course, you give them the best free parking place close, close to the hospital entrance. This is literally all you had to do. That was what the business was. Well, what has changed? And this has made it very complex. And this is why we need to work with our physician leaders in partnership, okay? Declining reimbursement, all right? This is dramatic. I know the, I know the physician rates have gone down, but, but hospital rates have really gone down. I recently worked at a hospital in Pennsylvania where we did a great job. You know why? Because we were able to negotiate great rates with the payers. So we were able to go to the Blue Cross and the Signals and the Uniteds and negotiate great rates. 250% of Medicare with the Blues, okay? 199% of Medicare for Aetna. That was a win, right? That was great. Is that still great? No. We became the priciest, most expensive hospital, okay? Because our competitors were underpricing us. So we were getting priced out of the market. The Blue Cross plans started doing these tiers, and we were getting tiered out of the Blue Cross plans. Okay, so now we got to say, look, if we're 250% of Medicare reimbursement and our competitors are at 150%, how do I take a 20 or 30% cut in my reimbursement and survive? Okay, that's a huge challenge, and that goes into the capital challenges. 
It used to be you could get bond financing. As long as you had your cost-based reimbursement, you were doing okay, you could always qualify for very low cost uh, bond uh, municipal financing, right? Capital is really tough. How many people here have gone to their CEO and asked for capital and not gotten it? Everyone, right? You know why? It's not there. It's, it's almost completely gone, okay? Let me give you an example. Hospital I'm working at in Connecticut. In the state of, is anybody here from Connecticut? What the governor did in Connecticut was arbitrarily assess a quote unquote tax to all the hospitals. This is a hospital that's $300 million in revenue. By the way, hospitals are very small margin businesses, okay? A three to 4% margin is really, really good for a hospital, okay? So $300 million, he taxed them $20 million, like that. Poof, those dollars are gone. This hospital has been struggling over the last four years to not do what's called, which we call violating your bond covenant, which means you have to have a certain amount of cash on hand. If you go below that, you violate your bond covenant. That, folks, is a really, really bad situation. You do not want that to happen to your hospital CEO. Because what happens is a lot of people from New York and these places descend on you and make your life miserable. So this hospital had to, had to maintain their cash. Okay, therefore, when the ED director went and said, we just went over 100,000 visits, I need more ED space and room and equipment, there's no capital there to invest. If you can't invest capital and grow your business, your business is not going to survive. These are things that we didn't really have to face in the past, but we're facing now. Changes in payment structure, managed care, right? Going to more risk-based contracts, going towards this whole issue of value, because you have to understand the value-based purchasing for the hospitals has been in place for a lot longer than it has been for the physicians. We've had, we've had readmissions penalties, we've had penalties for never events, we've had you know, penalties for all kinds of things that happen in the hospital. So this whole thing about value is, is a real challenge. Rack audits, this, we've, never, we've never faced the scrutiny that we're facing now. Again, the good old days, you perform a service, you submit a, a bill, you get paid. Now it's a guessing game. And let me tell you something, okay? What, what CEOs hate and CFOs hate is uncertainty. You do not want to go to the board and stand up before the board and say, okay, here's, here's our results from this month. Why are they so far off budget? And why are they so different from last year? You do not want to explain differences. We don't like variation. We like predictability. But if you can't predict the revenues that are flowing in because you're getting rack audits and denials, that is a huge, huge problem. So now, it, we used to be an admission, we thought it was an admission, it may or may not be an admission because we're gonna get rack audits and a lot of denials. So that's a real challenge. Physician employment, remember that free labor we used to have, right? Those were the good old days. Let me tell you a secret, okay? Although we're employing all these physicians, we really don't want to do it, okay? We don't. Don't take this the wrong way. We don't like employing physicians. They don't make the greatest employees in a lot of cases. They're very independent and headstrong. I think you know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you may say that you need to do certain types of things. They may or may not do it. It's very difficult going in and acquiring, say, for example, a primary care physician practice and trying to, to change traditional practice patterns. So that's a real challenge. The other problem is how we lose the, on an average of 100,000 to 150,000 per physician per year. So it's a huge investment. So here's what happens, is the board, remember the board is made up of all these people. I, I, I was on a hospital where the board, there were still people there from 1960 when they built the hospital. They were saying, now let me get this straight. We've, we've been in business for 50 years. We've had physicians on the medical staff. They brought us on this business. We made all this money. Now you're telling me that I have to have this line item a multi-million dollars, $10 million line item for physician practice employment. Why do I need that now? That is, I, that is a tough, tough question to answer to boards, to say, look, we, we have to employ physicians, our, our competitors are employing physicians. You know, in certain markets, I was working in Pittsburgh, 80% of the physicians are employed by one of the health systems. So it seems to be that there's a trend that that's where they're going. Um, and that's something that we need to do. Okay, population health. It used to be easy, okay? We talked about it, you heard Jim sort of refer to it as that you put, a, put up an ED in the cornfield and it starts filling up because people need services, right? 
That was the old model. You opened up your doors and people started coming in. Under population health, the concept is, you're, here's a population. Here's a, a, an attributed population. Here's a panel of patients. You need now to manal, manage the entire healthcare of that panel. A completely different orientation with a completely different skill set that we don't have in the hospital industry. We haven't done this type of thing. We know what happens when they hit the ED, they go through the acute care episode, and we discharge them. That's traditionally where we've been. We haven't spent a lot of time on the front end and on the back end, as I talked about yesterday. So that's a real challenge. And this whole thing about the utilization paradox, right? We want more business. We want more admissions. We want more people coming in the door. Oh, wait a second. Do we? What's the right level? All right? How do we manage down utilization? Because remember, in population health, the major spending reduction is going to be in reducing hospital utilization. How do we reduce hospital utilization while at the same time making sure that we're all busy and getting people in the door? And that's a real paradox, and that's something that's, that's going to be uh, a key challenge as we move forward navigating the transition, the old cliche of having one foot in two boats. And I can talk a little bit about how we're doing that at the company I'm working at now. Okay, so here are the nightmares the, the re, regarding the ED that I just want to just sort of you know, you know, talk a little bit about and how we address this. Um, the whole thing about goals and role definition. As we move forward in population health, we're all in this together, right? We talked about this yesterday. So what happens outside the hospital with the community physician, with the primary care physicians, with the specialists, and what happens when those patients that are attributed now to the, that primary care, who, by the way, has a financial incentive for limiting utilization. And what did we say yesterday? What, what, what was the first thing you do in population health? You keep them out of the ED, right? So they have, a, they have an incentive now to not go to the ED. The problem is there may be a perception that once they hit the ED, that your job is a little bit different, right, than the primary care physician's job. Your job is more of a ruling out the worst case scenario, right? So we start to see some of those conflicts in there. And the question is really, how are we gonna to try to manage those conflicts with the patient caught in the middle? Misalignment of incentives under population health. This is what we're talking about now. This is, the, this is sort of the contradiction that, that we're facing. Volume versus value. And they're not mutually exclusive. So this is, this is the way that we're looking at it now from our hospital. You want to be the low cost, high quality hospital, all right? Think about my example in Pennsylvania, when we were at 250% of, of Medicare with our Blue Cross contract, right? There was no, it was no big deal if we had high costs because we could cover it through that margin because we had such high charges. But that, we were stuck, stuck in a cycle of being the most expensive hospital. None of us buy the most expensive of anything, right? We look at reference pricing, we try to get a good deal. A good deal is spending a lot of money and getting value, right? So if, if you're spending too much money, that's too expensive. So what we wanted, what, here's, here's the theory that we're thinking of doing here, is to get risk, start to get risk-based contracts. And we were talking about this last night at dinner. One of the, believe it or not, most lucrative type of risk-based contracts, Medicaid huge dollars. We were talking about this Montefiore. Where's Montefiore? Where in New York? Bronx. They're making tons of money off of Medicaid risk contracts. Tons of money. Okay? But the idea is, and the concept that we have in our hospital system is, you have got to be able to deliver that care and make a margin. In other words, you've got to be able to deliver that care less than Medicaid, right? So the concept is, you become the low-cost hospital, you go get your own risk contracts, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, commercial contracts, and you put those patients in your hospital because you know you're the low-cost hospital. Once you get that reputation for being the low-cost hospital, then you go to other networks. You go to other IPAs and say, look, look at our costs. Look at our cost profile, look at our utilization profile, look at our length of stay, and they start sending you patients, okay? So, so that's where the value, right? Value being a value for the price that you're paying and the cost meets the new volume, both the risk-based and risk-based from other IPA networks. 
So, so sort of think of that in your head, in that we're still going to want lots of patients to come through our doors, but they're gonna, it's going to be a different source. It's not just going to be fee-for-service mill, okay? It's going to be, it's going to be IPAs and networks and risk-based contracts where people are looking for value and selecting your hospital because you're providing that value and helping them make their margin on, on the risk-based contracts, okay? Doing everything possible versus disease management. We talked yesterday a little bit about care plans and the concept of disease management and how the ED needs to be a part of that partnership with the primary care physicians. Patient satisfaction, tension, and balance. I'm surprised I've been here a day and a half and I haven't heard somebody say this, right? Okay, if we, let's talk about the, the gentleman who talked about the CAT scan yesterday, right? What happens, what do you, what's your patient's reactions when, you're, when you start to say to them, you really don't need a CAT scan, you really don't need this test, you, I, you really don't need that. <coughs> what happens? They, they get low patient satisfaction, right? Because we, we've sort of conditioned the patients to say, you come in, we're gonna do all this stuff for you, and now if we don't do all this stuff for them, they're gonna have lower patient satisfaction. But at the same time, we have this paradox where we need to have high patient satisfaction for the HCAP scores as we talked about yesterday. So, so that's, that's a real challenge. And then finally, resource utilization management, uh, effective um, streamlined use of resources moving forward. All right, a lot of talk about admissions and, and Jim sort of, he sort of, uh, you know, said, said in his talk that that's really not your role to determine whether it's an admission or not. Um, but this, is, again, is a real challenge for us on the administrative side because it's unpredictable, right? This whole thing about the two midnight rule, this whole thing about unpredictable revenue cycle uh, with denials and rack audits. I'll give you a story in a hospital that I worked at. Um, it's funny because you get the result that you sort of incentivize, right? So we were getting all these denials um, from, from the commercial payers on our, on our admissions. So, what did they, so, so the CEO said, actually it was a health system that said, you have got to reduce your denial rate on, on inpatient admissions. So what did they do? Started shifting them to observations. And guess what, it worked, right? We weren't getting any denials because we were shifting them to observations. So what happened? Our observations ballooned and our admits went down. Okay, a better alternative, if, 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 you know, if, if you assume that everything's saying the same, that those admits before should have been admits, better clinical documentation, right? CDI, clinical documentation to make sure that you're documenting that, that patient admissions um, are, are actually going to be admissions. Well, yes? Uh, when, when they went to the two midnight rule, the, <coughs> the CMS was saying that this was going to reduce the number of RAC audits necessary. Has that been linked to the new? No, I have not seen that. We've <laughs> Yeah. Kind of quit right, right as the two midnight rule came in, but I'm not sure. I haven't. Anybody else seen that? I have not seen the change. We, I've seen a lot more rack audits. There we go. Customer service. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a uh, that's from a uh, a restaurant, I guess. Somebody <laughs> wrote it in ketchup, right? Um, you know, look. We we really think that you are sort of. The, you are definitely the face of the hospital, okay? You're generally going to be the first interaction the patients have with our hospital, okay? What happens first is going to, is going to you know, shape the entire stay, what happens every other place, okay? So this is a real challenge for us in admin because, you know, how, how do you really improve customer service? How do you really improve attitudes? And it's something that, that um, we're, we're all working on. I know that there's challenges. Sherry talks a lot about the challenges, for example, with the level and the experience, especially of the nurses in the ED, how we have a lot of younger, maybe not as experienced nurses due to the nurse shortage, and that's a, that's a real challenge. Um, this whole thing about patient flow and age caps, um, and this, this issue about, you know, what are the things that we can do to improve? So like, for example, discharge callbacks, calling back every single patient a day or two days later to see how they're doing. Um, and we talked about sort of the sort of leveraging uh, the EMTs to do more um, um, home visits. Okay, 
this is really what we want, okay? I'm gonna do a talk later this morning about, um, about how you choose the difference between small groups, large groups, contracted groups, national groups, okay? Here's, here's what we need from you. And here's what I've seen, no matter if it's been a national group or a local group, we've got to have leadership in the ED. We, and that's why when, when Sherry, even Carson talks about physician leadership, the leadership that you bring in the ED is critical to us, okay? We can't do it administratively. It's, it's more of a clinical type of thing. You're the quarterback, you're the interface. The thing about the ED is even though you, you have a unique position, all right? You're in the hospital, and you know everything that happens in the hospital and how to work in the hospital, but you also know all the physicians in the community and interact with all the physicians in the community. So you're really the hub. The challenge that we have when deciding should we go with a national group like a Team Health or an MCARE, should we go with our local guys that we like, it doesn't really matter, it's all about leadership. It's that single strong leader in the group is the key to everything. And frankly, you know, the CEO, so you sort of see the way this diagram is, he's sort, of, he's sort of pointing to the leader to do the clinical leadership. The CEO definitely does not want to get involved, especially in these clinical types of disputes, um, if at all possible. Payer contracting. I don't, I don't think this is a, a challenge as much as it used to, but I've seen situations before where the ED group was not uh, contracted with all the payers that the hospital was contracted with, but I, I don't think that that's, that's a, a big uh, uh, a challenge anymore. What the challenge is, and we discussed this yesterday, is how do you align the economic incentives so that for the managed care contracts you have, there is, there is an incentive for the ED group to do what the managed care calls for. So, so for example, it's not just based on volume and cranking patients through. It's also based on things like quality and H, especially H caps and patient service. So you're going to see a lot more contracts structured um, to, uh, to align those types of obje objectives. Um, nightmare seven, again, this goes back to what I was talking about yesterday. What is the evolving role of the ED? As we have all these different types of access centers and services out there, how do we keep the ED relevant? How do we keep the ED at the center of this? How do we keep the ED as part of the solution and, and not part of the problem? And that's sort of what we really implore you as ED leaders to do, to come to the, to the C-suite with solutions, with, with ideas about all the operations, because again, you're really that hub that knows between the, the hospital um, and the community. This concept of even though you're gonna be primarily an episodic care provider, trying to reorient your thinking towards helping us with the total disease management of the patient and, and, and interfacing with that. And what are some of the things that you can do? What are some of the innovations? Maybe in your slow times, opening up follow-up discharge clinics. Uh, maybe uh, doing sort of more types of follow-up exams, making sure that the patients are taking their meds, that they're on their meds, that they're, that they're filling their prescriptions. Uh, for medication and helping us uh, manage that. It's, a, it's absolutely a key touch point for us uh, moving forward. Um, conflicts with community, community physicians, I already talked a little bit about this, um, but closer collaboration and really, in a sense, becoming an extension of the, of the primary care physician's practice as opposed to the place that they just send patients after, after five o'clock and then trying to find some uh, ITEHR solutions. Uh, this is a slide that you saw yesterday, but the, this whole concept of alternatives. How do we create these alternatives and develop these low-cost alternatives? Because we've heard, and the data, as Jim pointed out, proves this, is that even though urgent care centers and retail care centers open, your volumes are still gonna go up because we still have an aging population with a lot more chronic disease, clearly. So, how do we collaborate and interface across the spectrum? Not necessarily owning all of these things, but, but coming up with, uh, with valuable working relationships. So how can you help us? Be kind to your poor beleaguered CEO. <laughs> um, help us run interference with the medical staff um, when, the, when there's some real challenges. Become part of the solution. 
All of you should, all of you should here's, here's something I, I encourage you, and I hope you're all doing this, is that if there is an ACO at your hospital or a clinically integrated network, you should be a part of that ACO. As a matter of fact, the, we, the, we had the ED uh, on the board as leaders in our ACO because they're so critical to it. So, so become part of these clinically uh, integrated uh, networks. Uh, leverage best practices and embrace the future.